come up with the idea. And, and all the neighbors would come. I need someone to walk through this. I have an idea. He would laugh when I would do Shakespeare or something. Hi, I'm Mariel Hemingway. I was born in Mill Valley, California on November 22, 1961, and I was brought up in Sun Valley, Idaho, or Ketchum, Idaho, which is a, now a fairly well-known ski resort, but it was a fairly small town when I grew up. Um, it's also known for being the place where my grandfather wrote a lot of books. So I grew up in sort of a famous, um, a famous town, so to speak, because of my grandfather. I went to Ernest Hemingway grade school, which is a bit daunting because um, the minute you handed in an English paper, they wondered, you know, if it was going to win a Pulitzer Prize, which it didn't. Um. <laughs> Well, what's very interesting about that is that my grandfather, being the extraordinary human being that he, that he was, and my father, being his first son, you would think there would be this tremendous, you know, open dialogue about him, but my father actually didn't speak about my grandfather that often. My grandfather, interestingly enough, probably wasn't a very good father. He was a better, you know, he was... He was a great artist, but he didn't really know how to be a father. So my dad didn't really have a lot to say. So it didn't, he didn't speak about him, but I lived in this town that honored him and all that. What I did understand is that when I started reading his books, and I read his books very early, I, I, I read The Old Man. The first book that I read at, at about 10 was The Old Man and the Sea. And my father took me to Paris, and he went around the different places um, uh, I was reading Movable Feast at that time, and he took me around to the different places where he was brought up, because my father spent the first 10 years of his life in Paris. So that was really extraordinary to me. And when I read his books when I was young, I felt as though, and this is, I used to, I laughed about this later in, in life, because I felt as though that I was being channeled, that I really understood my oh. grandfather at a level that nobody else did. Mm -hmm. I think I was, you know, fantasizing, but there you go. Oh. <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting to to talk about like when when that started. I mean, I was always a Hemingway. I was always part of this like incredible legacy, you know, this incredible family. But I grew up in Idaho, so it was a you know it was a small town, um, and I knew that I was kind of a part of this bigger picture. But I and even making you know I made my first movie with my sister called Lipstick, and I played her little sister, and it was really like pretend. I mean, to me, it was, you know, it was time off to come to Los Angeles and get school clothes. I mean, I was so oblivious to what the whole thing that I was doing was about. I'd done a little, I mean, you know, hi, I was 13. <laughs> How much could I, you know, I was 12 when I started. I turned 13 on the set. I, I didn't do that much. I mean, the, the most sort of in the sort of under pressure kind of thing that I'd ever done. I was a ski racer growing up. You know, I was ski raced till I was 16. So I, I would say that was the most kind of pressure I'd ever felt. I never was, but I was, you know, I mean, I grew up in, literally in a small town. So any kind of theater I did, I, I, I did after lipstick. I think that I can look back and be more, um, have a more critical eye about it, but I, I was very much aware of what I was doing. Um, I think I thought I knew more than I did. I mean, you know, I think anybody who's in their 20s thinks they're so brilliant and smart. I mean, I watch it in my daughters. Like, you can't tell them anything. But they're so smart, they know everything. Um, and they are at some level, but then there's no life experience. So I had no life experience, and yet I had an innate understanding of where I wanted to go and that art was very important to me. Not that I, you know, that, that I, not that I made the best choices always, but I made choices that challenged me as a human being. It wasn't ever about like, oh, is this going to motivate my career or is this going to make my, my life, you know, my life in, in show business longer. Mm -hmm. It just was, who am I? Who am I? Where can I learn more about me? Because I came from a really messed up family. I mean, as great and artistic and wonderful as they, as they were, there's a tremendous amount of addiction. There was mental illness. I mean, there's seven suicides in my family, which is kind of the, you know, the beauty and the beast of it. It's, it's the, the give and take of what you get in a family like that, which is great, but it's also what, um, my life was about survival. I think when I moved to New York at 16, 
I had no business moving there. I was too naive, I was too young, and my parents really shouldn't have let me go. 21 and one is 20. And my 21 year old is this incredible model with Elite. And she wants to be a star. And she's always wanted to be a star. And it's so ironic to me because that was never a drive for me. I never really cared about being a star. I wanted to be an actress. Well, a lot of that story is based on my life. Well, some people would consider, you know, getting a part in lipstick, playing your sister's little sister would be a big break. And then others would say that, you know, making a movie with Woody Allen called Manhattan, which is one of the greatest movies probably ever made, um, not because I'm in it, just because it's an amazing film. And I probably would say career-wise, that was probably the big breaking point. Um, I mean, I, I guess that's, those were big breaks for me. But I think the, the real moment when I really understood that something different was going on was when um, I had made Manhattan, which was kind of the big breakthrough movie for me. And I was 17 years old, and they sent me to Cannes, the Cannes Film Festival in, in, in Paris, not, I mean in France. And I was overwhelmed. I didn't know, I mean, going there, I went with my dad, it was all fun, and we went up the steps to, to this premiere, and, you know, there were thousands of photographers saying, Maria, 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 Maria. And I was, you know, and all these flashes, and I was so, like, it was so daunting. I had no idea. And I got into the theater after, you know, and I didn't know where to look. And it never, you know, I'd never been on a red carpet before and going upstairs and you're all dressed up. And my father was like kind of behind me. And we got into the theater like, you know, I was probably going to faint or something. And we got into the theater and we're watching the movie and my heart's beating really hard. And I'd never seen the film before. And I'm, and I'm playing this character who's really like, sexually open and really knows what's going on and I was so the opposite I was such a naive girl I never had a boyfriend I mean I think my first kiss was Woody Allen through the park and you know in this you know so I was like this really naive naive girl and in the middle of the movie I looked at my dad I said I can't go out I can't go out I can't leave really? they sent in a they sent a an ambulance for me because I was having an anxiety attack and I went back to the hotel and I just stayed in the room and I was in a little corner like shaking I mean it was so overwhelming to me I didn't realize until that mo moment anything that had gone on because I mean honestly when I agreed to do that movie I didn't know who Woody Allen was you know I might have been the most naive person on the planet and he's you know made me the sophisticated girl who was like you know had a billion boyfriends and knew it and was going to run off to Paris with some old guy. <laughs> oh no, I had performer's urge, there was no question. I thought that I was, you know, inside my mind, I was, but I was going to be a singer, you know, I was going to be on the Sonny and Cher show, those were things that I dreamt of, but I never told anyone. <laughs> You know, it's different than it is now. I mean, when, when, when girls become stars now, they have handlers. They have, you know, they've got managers and agents and PR people and people and stylists and people, you know, all these people. I didn't have people. You know, I had, no I had an agent who thought I should go to college. And I was like, yeah, but I really want to be an actress. I think I found what I want to do. So I didn't have a lot of people around me. I moved to New York City. Um, I left Idaho at 16. I'd made I'd made Manhattan, and I hadn't gone to Cannes yet. But I moved to New York on my own, so I was living in the Lower East Side. And what happened was there was you know there was media attention a little bit. You know I started to model a little bit, and I got on, you know I was in Life magazine and Time magazine, and then I was on the cover of People and stuff like that. But it I didn't ever pay attention to it because I, I remember thinking that. For me, being regular and being normal and being accessible to others was really more important to me than being a star. I never wanted to be a star. I have two daughters now. One is 
21 and one is 20. And my 21 year old is this incredible model with Elite, and she wants to be a star. And she's always wanted to be a star, and it's so ironic to me because that was never a drive for me. I never really cared about being a star. I wanted to be an actress. I wanted to be, you know, I wanted. And I wanted to do what I'm doing now, which I'll talk about later, but, you know, which is about health and wellness. But for me, that was never a motivator. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, it was all about the art. And people would say, why did you choose this script? Or why did you play that role? Where did, you know, what made it motivated you to go there? And for me, it was really about, I wanted to do something different for me because I always learned from a character that I played. I always became more of myself or understood myself a little bit more through somebody that I was playing. But what happens is, you know, I, I was a little, I, I was a young girl when I got married. When I met my husband and all that stuff and he was older than me and I, for many, many years, that was just perfect. You know, it was, it was somebody who was taking care of me, and it was security, and it was this, and it was that, and it was a, and I was going to be married forever because my family was so messed up and so crazy that it was like I'm going to hang in there. And my grandfather was married like five times, not me. I'm going to be married forever. Just getting it working together. in construction. My well, mom and dad were dancers, but I like going up. I think it was probably the most difficult time for me. Um, although you know, raising, being raised in a home where there was a lot of illness was difficult. Since it was my home, I didn't really realize it until I left. I think one of the most challenging times for me was when my sister committed suicide, because. And it was a, it really wasn't that long ago, 10, 15 years ago. Um, it was so heartbreaking because, at, first of all, the family as a whole denied it. We all did. We all pretended that you know it just, that she didn't commit suicide. That was number one. And number two, I felt as though once my sister had committed suicide, that I was next on the list. So I think that that was probably the most challenging time for me to really come to grips with the fact that I wasn't her. Part of the problem was my, you know, my, not only was there, you know, there was a lot of alcoholism in the family, but my mother had cancer, and I was her primary caregiver at age 10. I started taking care of her. I slept in the same room and made sure that, you know, when she got sick in the middle of the night that, I, that someone was there. Mm -hmm. And I took care of her for many years, and really by the time I was 16, I couldn't handle it anymore. I couldn't be that person. I'd lost a bit of my childhood. But, you know, and it, it's not a sad story. It's like a lot of people have to deal with certain things, but I needed, out, I needed a way out. So I left. But the truth is, I kind of wanted my parents to want me to stay, but they didn't. You know, they kind of let me go. Because I was very convincing, but there was the voice inside of me going, I wish my parents Shouldn't would just say, yeah, you know, don't go off and be in the land of, like, the Woody Allens and the, peop the Svengali's that want to mold your life. We want to take care of you and be your parents for a little longer. I mean, I remember thinking that, my, you know, at 16, my daughter you know, when she was at home, I want to move to New York. You were, you know, you were, I was like, you can't even brush your teeth without being reminded, you know, and I, and I was moving to New York. And so, so my life, I get back to, my life was about surviving. I was surviving mental illness, cancer. My dad had heart disease. There was, you know, there was alcohol abuse. And it's not that I don't love my family, because I did. I didn't know anything different. I thought they were kind of fantastic, but but in looking back, I wish they had, you know, because as a young woman, I remember feeling unloved. So when you leave home with that kind of thing, you feel like nobody loves you. So you're always, you know, so I'd be on a movie set kind of looking for a family. Oh, they're going to love me. Oh, they'll be the family that I need. And they all, and that's exactly what would happen. So I'd get very, very close, and then there would just be this breakup. And nobody cares because they make movies and, you know, that's just the way it is. And I would be heartbroken. This family that I'd made so close to me was gone. 
So then I would try to find another family. I mean, it was very, it was very interesting growth period for me because I would, I would get a little bit deeper into who I was with each. Um, I think I was most vulnerable probably um, from about 16 to probably when I got married at, at, at 23. So it was very, and I was vulnerable then, but I was also, you know, and then I met my husband and he was going to take care of me forever. I mean, you know, he proposed to me on a, on a, on a, on a bridge and said, I want to take care of you for the rest of my life. And I almost fell in the water because it was like, that's all I ever wanted was somebody to say, I'm going to take care of you, you know? And that was beautiful for 24 years. That was kind of what I held on to. And then I grew up during that time. And then I went, oh, I guess I don't need anybody to take care of me. I can take care of myself. Our journey together was over at that time, and my girls were, were had been, you know, they were grown and, and out of the house. It's not an epiphany. It doesn't happen overnight. But what happens is, you know, I, I was a little, I, I was a young girl when I got married. When I met my husband and all that stuff, and he was older than me, and I... For many, many years, that was just perfect. You know, it was, it was somebody who was taking care of me, and it was security, and it was this, and it was that. It was a, and I was going to be married forever because my family was so messed up and so crazy that it was like, I'm going to hang in there. And my grandfather was married like five times. Not me. I'm going to be married forever, and I'm going to show that you can do this. And what happens is that you just start to realize that you're your best teacher. You're your best therapist. You're your best friend. You know, you, you can sidestep that and get to the core of, of, of what works for your life. Because everybody's the individual. Nobody's going to eat like me. Nobody's going to do the same kind of exercise as me. Nobody's going to feel about their life the way that I do or you do, or you know, because everybody's individual. My mom and dad were What's beautiful is that, you know, I grew up being in a business, it's all about the way you look and being judged by others and, you know, uh, trying to stay skinny or do this and that. So it's inform what it did was it informs what I do now. And my, my passion is to be to be a real spokesperson for people to find their own power. And that's what really what happened for me. But it happened over time. And it happened through a lot of different journeys. And it led me to what I'm doing today, which is, um, you know, which is about health and wellness and yoga and breathing and being out in nature and connecting with food and the environment. I mean, these things are important to me. And, and it is, it, it's ex what's exciting about it is that the more I'm on my own, I mean, I have people in my life and, you know, whatever, but the more I take my own power, just being me, um, the more I can share that with others. Because I really want people to understand that they can be the, their best teacher, you know, nutritionist, healer, you know, therapist, whatever it is for them. And that's kind of my passion in my life through going through all these different things, mm, you know, all the different suicides and all the different things yeah. that I... And, you know, eating, eating strangely and all this different stuff that I've been through in my life, I get back to this place where, oh, I know what's right for me. I would, well, I'm not going to criticize anybody else because, you know, everybody has their own journey. I know that, you know, I've written four books, three books, three books, um, and they were, they're all about health and wellness and yoga and things like that. I, I wrote them because I know that my journey led me to there. You know, my first book was called um, Finding My Balance, which was about my life through the eyes of yoga. So I take a yoga posture and I let it lead into a story about my life. Not, you know, not dissimilar to talking to you, but I would look, kind of use a, a yoga posture as a, as a metaphor for something I was going through in my life. That was sort of the beginning of a journey, and I thought after writing that book, and 
I'd been through cancer with my ex-husband at that time, and that taught me a lot, you know, because I went from having, going through cancer with my mother, and then going through it with with my husband, and 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 with my ex helping him to heal himself through holistic means, mm -hmm. because I'd been so involved in yoga and food, and nutrition and meditation, and and I cr I kind of found that I had a voice for for health and wellness so to speak so my second book was called healthy living from the inside out and that's about home food exercise and silence and how those four things are sort of a cornerstones to creating your own health and wellness mm -hmm. this really is my passion I mean I really talk about food as it as the first connection towards being environmental mm -hmm. the the more that you can connect with your food nature you know with the, through local farming through sustainability through through um, through cooking which led me to my third book which is which is called Mariel's Kitchen which is a cookbook and um, and that's about eating seasonable season eating in season sustainability local farming organic blah 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 all these things and those are my passions and I'm writing a fourth book now which is with my boyfriend who's also really into health and wellness and it's about kind of being young and vital and and feeling how do you what kind of tools what kind of 100 points can you get to creating more vitality more wellness more feeling good about yourself and moving into the world in a way that that makes sense for you sure. it's it's about the individual so my passion is to just inspire people to be their best that they can be by by understanding that you know everybody has a journey everybody comes from some kind of wicked crazy background like like me I mean I have a, a lot of experience in that but I'm I only share it not to go oh poor me but to go hey I know we all come from this but guess what I have some tools and I've been down all these really retarded roads and you don't have to go down these retarded roads anymore you know you you can sidestep that and get to the core of of, of what works for your life because everybody's the individual nobody's going to eat like me nobody's going to do the same kind of exercise as me nobody's going to feel about their life the way that I do or you do or you know because everybody's individuals well I'm very excited about because I told you that I was in Paris with my um, father when I was 11 years old and he and I was reading a movable feast and he was taking me around to the different places so I have uh, bought the rights to a movable feast and I'm going to produce it into a film which right. is great actually I bought it several years ago and I was going to be in it but I think I'm too old now <laughs> oh, <come on. laughs> well maybe <laughs>